For every road, every mile of road that we have, there's two miles of ditch. And so it's easy to fall into a ditch on one side or the other. And regarding biblical giving, there's two ditches. Ditches, the, the ditch on one side is overemphasis, and we see that so often um, where, where ministries or, or pe- preachers focus, maybe not exclusively, but so much on the concept of giving and manipulation and coercion and being heavy-handed and pre- teaching that you give in order to get, and the focus is on what you can receive in this life. The other ditch to fall into, and this is probably the one that Southside leans toward a little bit more, is underemphasis. So we don't want to appear heavy-handed. We don't want to have that kind of appearance. And so sometimes we might shy away from the topic of giving. But there's a balance, and we need to find that because the Bible speaks a lot about finances, about giving, about money. And it's an important concept and, and topic, and so we need to not be afraid to discuss it. So my goal this morning is to share what Scripture says, and we're not going to be able to be exhaustive by any means. We're going to look at one passage in 2 Corinthians, but I want to share about what God says about giving, the biblical giving, and may we have an obedient heart and let the Spirit make application. The application is going to have a different flavor, a different look for every person who's here, and we'll trust him for that. Let's pray. Father, we do need you to empower these words because it's your word that is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Would you do that this morning? Would you be magnified and glorified? Give me uh, grace and love and our folks the same to receive your word with humility and uh, let the spirit do the application. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we uh, read our section in 2 Corinthians, just give you four kind of overarching principles about biblical giving. The first one is that giving is a matter of worship. It's a matter of worship. It's a matter of worship because it's a response to all that God has done for us. God has given us everything in Christ, and our giving is a response to that. It's, It's a matter of worship. It's a recognition that God owns everything. In Proverbs 3, the writer says in verse 9, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first or first fruits of all your produce. Our giving honors the Lord. It's a matter of worship. Secondly, it's a matter of obedience. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 38, give. That's a command. That's an imperative. Jesus says to give. And so our giving is a matter of obedience. Thirdly, giving is a matter of faith. Do we believe God's promises about finances? Do we believe that, as it says in Philippians 4, my God will supply all all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Do we believe that? Do we believe the next verse of Proverbs? I read Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. But what's the next verse? Verse 10, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I read or mentioned Luke 6, 38. Jesus says to give. But what does he say next? Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Do we believe what the only, the only words that Jesus um, spoke that were recorded outside the Gospels uh, while he was here on earth are in Acts where he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do we believe that since we don't know what the future is and, and we might be tempted to hold on to what we have because we got to secure our own future, do we have faith to believe that he who does know the future will supply our needs? So giving is a matter of worship. It's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of faith. Giving, fourthly, is a matter of the heart. It reveals often our priorities. Matthew 6, 21 from the Sermon on the Mount For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where our treasure is, where we have um, that focus, shows where our heart is. As with other matters of sanctification, God isn't looking just for an external response. Okay, I'll write a check. 
because I feel co coerced into doing it. He's looking for a heart, a heart attitude. So giving is a matter of the heart. And, and let me just echo Paul's words in 2 Corinthians. It's not the passage we're going to focus on, but he's talking to the Corinthians. He says, I don't want your, I don't want, uh, for I do not seek what is yours, but you. He wasn't seeking money from them, gifts necessarily for himself. He wanted them. He wanted their hearts. And so my goal in, in uh, speaking here is not what is yours, it's you. Uh, we want your heart. And that's what God is looking for. Is giving is a matter of the heart. Having said that, let's read Second Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. Just to set some context, this is Paul's, probably his fourth letter to the Corinthians. It's anticipating um, his third visit to them. In this letter, he defends his integrity as an apostle. He discusses ministry and aspects of, of Christian ministry. He makes appeals to the Corinthians, and then he prepares for um, his trip by defending his apostleship. And here in the middle, in chapters 8 and 9, he pulls out and talks about a collection that was being given, being gathered, and going to be sent to the saints in Jerusalem who were in desperate need. This collection had already been started in his a letter to the Corinthians, what we call 1 Corinthians, in verse 16, he talks about the collection for the saints. And so here he is just continuing that discussion. And he uses the churches in Macedonia as his example, showing that uh, the heart of biblical giving, that's what we're looking for at today, the heart of biblical giving, an example of that was in the churches of Macedonia. Macedonia was the northern part of Greece. Greece uh, was split into two. Macedonia in the north, Achaia in the south, and the Corinth was in the south. In the north were the three churches of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And the uh, northern part of Greece, called Macedonia, had been impoverished and overrun by the Romans, by Ro Roman rule. And so um, those are the folks that Paul is using as an example. In other scriptures, their generosity their heart of giving is also called out. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 9, Paul talks about the brothers, the brethren from Macedonia, fully supplying his need. In Philippians 2, 25, he talks about Epaphroditus, who is your messenger, Philippi, your messenger and minister to my need. And he also says in Philippians 4 that the Philippians gave, sent him a gift more than once. And so these are people who are known for their giving and uh, their generous heart. So let's look at the 10 characteristics. There might be more, but this passage uh, gives us 10 characteristics of the heart of biblical giving. 10 characteristics of the heart of biblical giving. The first one uh, is in verse one, of course, motivated by God's grace. Biblical giving is motivated by God's grace. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. And this is so key to have this as the first one, because this is the foundational aspect. This is the one overriding or undergirding all the others. Our giving is motivated by God's grace. It's not human coercion. It's not to satisfy our, our conscience. It's not based on our philanthropy or our nobleness of heart. It's a response of what God has done for us and in us and to us in the gospel. It's not to earn his favor, as Ken spoke on freedom last week. 
Uh, so often we think that we can do, do, do in order to earn God's favor and acceptance and standing with him. And maybe if I give to God and some money, if I throw a dollar in the offering plate, maybe that will buy him some, buy me some favor from him. And uh, it's totally against the, the freedom of the gospel. Our giving is a response to God's grace to us through, in Christ, in the gospel, and it's a, it's a means of grace in the church. Grace motivates me to be like my father. He's holy, and his grace empowers and motivates me to be holy. He's loving, forgiving. His grace motivates me to be that way. He is a giving God, for God so loved the world that he gave, and his grace motivates me to be like him. Paul says in verse 6, he calls it this gracious work. He's, in verse 7, he calls it this gracious work. In verse 19, chapter 8, he calls it this gracious work. So this collection for the saints is a gracious work. It's a work of grace. A work of grace in the heart and the response is giving. Secondly, Biblical giving is unhindered by trial, in verse 2. That in a great ordeal of affliction, the Macedonians, the churches there, um, had been crushed and pressed by the Romans. The word ordeal means the testing or proving of metal through fire in a furnace. The word affliction is the crushing, refers to the crushing of grapes, or pressing, or tribulation. These people have been pressed and crushed through Roman persecution, Roman oppression, persecution as Christians. However, that did not stop them from having a desire and a heart to give. They weren't focused so much on their immediate situation that they used it as a reason not to give. And, and I would venture to say that probably 99, if not 100% of us, are nowhere near um, the, the, the crushing that uh, they, are, they endured. Now, very possibly there's crushing of health, there's crushing of finances um, in today's economy, um, but as we're going to see, their poverty reached even to the point of helplessness. And, uh, and yet, despite all that, uh, that was not a reason not to give. So their giving was unhindered by trial. Thirdly, we're still in verse 2, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy is done joyfully. Again, it wasn't coerced. It wasn't manipulated by Paul. It wasn't, it wasn't a PowerPoint and slideshow of, of um, people tugging at heartstrings. It was done joyfully. They had an abundance of joy. Abundance talks about overflowing or surplus. They had a surplus of joy in doing this. It was not a drudgery. It was not a chore for them to give. If you compare uh, chapter 9, verse 7, at the end of verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. And the Greek word there is hilaros, which we get our English word hilarious. And that doesn't mean being silly and, and overcome with laughter, um, but it, it does refer to a happy and a glad heart. God loves a hilarious giver. And so is that, does that characterize me? Because that characterized the Macedonians. Fourthly, biblical giving is not based on economic condition. And this is related to the, uh, the second one about un being unhindered by trial. But in verse 2, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty. They were in deep poverty. The word deep talks about the concept of being at rock bottom. They had hit rock bottom, these people in Macedonia. The poverty talks about being a beggar. That's the concept of being a beggar, being completely helpless um, to provide for yourself. You're relying on others. And yet, in, despite that situation, being in that condition, they were resting on God's promises for, for provision of their, of their needs. And again, they were not using that as a reason not to give. Well, um, that's an example to us. Of course, wisdom needs to be applied, so let's not go overboard and say that regardless 
um, of anything that's happening in your life, you have to give. That's not what I'm saying. And again, grace is the foundation of all this. Wisdom needs to be applied, uh, but let's also learn that their giving was not based on their economic condition. Fifthly, we're still in verse 2. Biblical giving is generous. Their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. They were generous. The, what characterized them was joy plus poverty equals generosity. The word overflow talks about being abundant in excess, like a river overflowing its banks. They were overflowed with generosity. And the, wealth, the, the words wealth of liberality talk about being sincere, being single-minded. Their focus was to honor God and to be devoted to his causes and uh, not saying, well, I need to hold back some for myself. I'll give you something, but I need to also think of me. They were, they were single-minded in their giving. Go over again to verse, chapter 9, verse 6. Paul talks about the same type of concept Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, generously, will also reap bountifully. Their giving was characterized by generosity. Sixthly, verse 3. It was according to their ability. Verse 3, for I testify that according to their ability, they gave. And this tells us that giving is proportionate. Ability, the, word, the Greek word for ability is dunamis. As we're familiar with that, power, dynamite. According to the, their ability, their power, they gave. And um, it's important to understand that in the New Testament, actually throughout the Bible, free will giving has no set percent. And especially in the New Testament, since that's the, the era that we live in, uh, giving is not a required 10%, what we also often think of as tithe, tithe or tithing. We're going to take a little bit of a diversion here and just explore that a little bit. Um, in the New Testament, the tithe is not the set or directed uh, amount for giving. In the Old Testament, the tithe was talked about even before Moses and the law. When Abraham met Melchizedek, He tithed, he gave him 10% of the spoils, and that was done voluntarily. It was not directed by God. It was also a one-time event that we've recorded, that we have recorded for us. Also, when Jacob was, um, uh, I think, going into uh, the promised land, uh, at one point in his life, he promised God 10%. If you'll be my God, if you'll be with me and give me success, so on and so forth, I'll give you 10%. Again, that was voluntary. It's almost a manipulation of God, perhaps, but it was a voluntary thing. It was not directed. When Moses came and the law was given, there were different kinds of giving that were, um, two kinds of giving that were described, uh, required and voluntary. Under the required giving, and this is where tithing, the concept of tithing is spoken of in, in the law, Israel had several tithes. They didn't have just one tithe, one ten percent. They had multiple ones. The first tithe is talked about um, to support the Levites. The Levites were the uh, chosen, as we learned in Sunday school this morning, they were the uh, chosen or holy or separated tribe to do God's work, to administer the country, administer the nation. And their support, they didn't have, um, they didn't have inheritance in Israel. So their support was through the tithe, one of the tithes that the Israelites gave. In Numbers 18, God says to give the tithe to the Levite as their support. A second tithe was uh, described in Deuteronomy 14, where every year the Israelites were to tithe, give 10% of their produce, and that that appears to be to support the national, the three or more um, um, festivals that they would have every year. And then also in Deuteronomy 14, every three years, they were to do a tithe that was to be given kind of as a welfare to support the poor, uh, widows, etc. So if you add those up and and annualize those, that's about 23% per year. So 
if you hear God says to tithe 10%, well, in Israel, it was more than 10%. They were also told not to glean the corners of their fields, um, allow the poor to, re- to uh, glean there and, and get some wheat and so forth. They also had the temple shekel that they were to pay. So God had directed giving that exceeded what we consider a 10% tithe. There was also, in in addition to directed giving, there was free will giving. And throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, free will giving had no set percent, no set amount. And I'd like to take you to Exodus 25. We'll see this in action, Exodus 25. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians because we will get back there. Exodus 25, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to raise from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and so on and so forth. God's calling for a collection, a contribution to um, build and supply, outfit, the sanctuary, the tent. Flip over to Exodus 35, and we'll see this being carried out. Thirty-five, verse four. Moses t- spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, "This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it as the Lord's contribution: gold and silver and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet material, so on and so forth." Uh, go on down to verse twenty. Then the heart, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' his presence. Everyone whose heart stirred him. And everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets, all articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord. Every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and porpoises' skins brought them. Everyone who could, everyone who, who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought to the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and in fine linen. All the women whose heart stirred a, with a skill spun the goat's hair. Again, verse 29, the Israelites, all the men and women whose heart moved them to bring material for the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, brought a freewill offering to the Lord. And so they responded with hearts that moved them. And what was the result? Chapter 36, verse 4, and all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work which he was performing, And they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for this construction work which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer bring work for the contributions of the sanctuary, perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more. For the material that they they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. God made a call. He, he, did direct, he did direct this, but it was according to uh, as the people's heart moved them. And they responded in such a way, uh, graciously, as it were, that they brought in so much that there was not any more needed. In Deuteronomy 16, God calls them to appear to, uh, three times a year to festivals, and he says, don't come empty-handed. But he says to come with a gift as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Again, it's proportionate. It's not a set amount for free will offering. First, First Chronicles 29, verse 9, uh, there was also an offering for the temple. 
And it says, then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly, for they made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart, and King David also rejoiced greatly. So there was required giving in support of national interests, those who administered the nation uh, for the common festivals, for welfare. What, w- what would we um, make the analogy from, from there to today? That'd be our taxes. That is directed, and in Romans 13, we are called to pay taxes. And uh, that's, not an, uh, that's not an option. But free will giving, giving um, is no set amount, no set percentage. In the New Testament, when Zacchaeus was converted, what did he do? He said, Lord, I'm going to give half of what I own to the poor, and if I've stolen anything, I'm going to restore it four times. Now, Jesus could have said, well, you should just give you know, 10%, you can keep the other 40 yourself, um, or maybe give it to uh, Judas, who keeps our purse. No, he allowed him to give the 50%. In 1 Corinthians 16, when Paul was talking about the uh, contribution to the Corinthians the first time, he said, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, he said, as you may prosper, as a person prospers, let him regularly bring it, so that uh, no, no uh, collection has to be made when I come. It's, but it's as he may prosper. Going back to Second Corinthians 8, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, but now, finish the, but now finish doing it also, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your ability. By your ability. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So we don't call for a set percent. The Bible doesn't call for a set percent. It's a heart that says, as God has prospered me, I'll respond in giving. Some of us can give a lot, and some of us can't give much. And again, it's not the percent, it's the heart behind it. Seventhly, if that's a word, verse 3, their giving was sacrificial. For I testify that according to their ability, proportionate, and beyond their ability, they gave. It was sacrificial. It was beyond their ability. It cost them something. David said, I will not offer the Lord that which cost me nothing. And... uh, the story of, in Mark 12 of the, the widow who gave very small amounts of money, two insignificant coins, while everyone else was throwing in their gifts and lavishly trumpeting their, their giving before men, she throws in two small coins, and Jesus says she gave more than everyone else. Why is that? Because she gave sacrificially. She gave out of her want, out of her need, out of her, her poverty, Um, her whole livelihood. It was sacrificially given. Again, wisdom needs to be applied. There's balance here. This is not a call to recklessly say, I'm going to sacrifice everything and and put my house on the market and put my family in jeopardy. Now, maybe that's what God's calling to do some radical things, but I'm I'm not calling for that and saying that applies to every person. There has to be wisdom here. We don't charge up $10,000 on a credit card so I can give to the church. Let's have wisdom here. But giving is sacrificial, and that's what uh, is called for. And so I think it is wise to take an inventory of our lives. Is there something in my life, God, between me and you, is there anything in my life that can be sacrificed to your glory? Ken spoke a couple weeks ago about John Patton, who was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands down by Australia. He's one of my favorite missionaries as well. He gives this story about a new believer. Speaking of this, this new believer, in his fresh love, he wanted to do something to show his gratitude to Jesus. He had a young family, and the way was barred to the mission field. His dear wife and he calculated over all their expenditure to find how much they could save to support the work of Jesus at home and abroad. Little or nothing could be spared from what appeared necessary claims. He 
he fell upon his knees and in tears implored God to show him how he could do something more to save the perishing. A voice came to him like a flash. If you so care for me and my work, you can easily sacrifice your pipe. He instantly took up his pipe and laid it before the Lord, saying, There it is, O my Lord, and whatsoever it may have cost me shall now be from year to year be thine. So this is not a a lesson on smoking, but for that guy, (laughs) that man took inventory with tears, saying, God, my budget is already trimmed to the bone. What can I give sacrificially to your work? And God showed him something that was um, that could be sacrificed, something that was a pleasure to him, something that he was used to and enjoyed, and that was a sacrifice to give. But, but what does it say? He instantly took it and laid it before the Lord, and he said, here it is. And uh, he's commended for that. Number eight, we're still in verse three. Biblical giving is voluntary. It's voluntary. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. They wanted to do this. It wasn't coercion. It wasn't heavy-handedness that obligated them or manipulated them into giving. It was their own choice. Paul says in verse 8, for I'm not speaking this as a command. Even Paul was couching his instruction to the Corinthians not as a command. This is not do this or else you're out. It was um, something that should be done voluntarily. In chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says that everyone must do as he has purposed in his heart. This is voluntary. This is not coercion. Voluntary. And this requires reflection. It requires consideration. It requires prayerful thought before the Lord. It requires perhaps budgeting, maybe for the first time to see what I do have coming in and what I have going out and what can be uh, dedicated to the Lord. Leaders, as leaders, we're to be careful not to um, be influenced to coerce and uh, influenced by money and coerce our people. Paul talks, or Peter talks in 1 Peter 5, that we're not to be an elder for the purpose of sordid gain. In Philippians 4.17, Paul says, not that I seek the gift itself. He commends the Philippians for giving to him. I'm not seeking the gift itself, though, but I seek for the profit or the fruit which increases to your account. So we're not here to coerce, but encourage voluntary giving. Number nine, biblical giving is viewed as a privilege. Verse four. What were they doing? They were begging us with much urging for the favor of, of participation in the support of the saints. Again, it was not an obligation. They were begging for the favor. Favor here is the word charis, grace. The grace, again, it's underscored and and wrapped in grace. They wanted the favor, the grace, the privilege of giving to support the saints. Um, The participation in the support of the saints. The word participation there is koinonia, fellowship. You want fellowship? Part of fellowship is giving uh, to God and and to his need and to his causes. Tenthly, verse 5, And this, their giving, was not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Biblical giving is dedicated first to God and then to his leaders, to his people, to his causes. Um, As I mentioned earlier, one of the overarching concepts of giving is is that it's worship. It's an act of worship. And these people, these Macedonians, they first, as a priority, not first in time, but first in priority, gave themselves to God as an act of worship, acknowledging everything they had belonged to God. And secondly, they gave to his leaders. Early in the life of the church in Acts, the people gave amongst themselves. They gave to each other. And as it grew, it probably was a little bit... um, more efficient to give to the leaders to distribute and to manage things. And here, um, they gave to the leaders, to entrusted their gift to the leaders to be given to 
the, the folks in Jerusalem who had the need. It demonstrated their trust and their confidence in Paul and his companions to fulfill the ministry. And it requires integrity. And in verse 20 of chapter 8, Paul's talking about the people who are uh, taking this gift. And how do they carry themselves? They are, they are taking precaution so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Paul and his companions, and this is a call for biblical leadership in the matter of giving, it has to be done with integrity. It has to be done with carefulness. And I'd like to say to you that that is, that is uh, what is done here. If you don't know, the elders here at Southside do not know what individual people give. We get summary reports and we, we get informed about the level of giving and so forth, but there is no detail given to the elders on who gives what. That's done by faithful people, um, and we trust them to account for that and give us the summary, but we don't need to know because that could influence how we interact and how people are perceived or, or um, treated, and we want none of that. And so there's no um, knowledge by the elders of who gives. This is, again, a heart issue. This is a heart matter. This is between you and the Lord, and we don't need to be inside there. As a corollary to that, let me say that biblical giving is primarily done in the context of the local church. That's not to say there are other causes to support and help. Uh, my family is involved with two missionary endeavors um, with organizations outside of Southside. Um, but primarily, our giving is to be to the local church. There's lots of causes. We can save the whales and, and save rainforests and things like that. They might all be noble causes, but our primary giving to honor God is in the context of the local church. Let's just quickly review the characteristics of biblical giving. It's motivated by God's grace. It's unhindered by trial. It's done joyfully. It's not based on economic condition. It's characterized as generous. It's according to ability. It's sacrificial. It's voluntary. It's viewed as a privilege. And it's an act of worship dedicating first to God as priority and then to his leaders and his causes. Let me just briefly give four results of biblical giving. If you give in this way with this kind of a heart, what, what does that mean? What, is, what can you expect? What, do you, what does that show? Number one, it proves love and obedience. Verse 8 of chapter 8, Paul says, I'm not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others, through the earnestness of the Macedonians, I'm proving, this proves the sincerity of your love also. He says in chapter 9, verse 13, because of the proof given by this ministry, by the, this ministry of giving is proving to these Jewish believers that the Gentiles are also part of the family of God. Uh, because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ. We confess Christ and he has saved us by his gospel. A, pr a proof of that is giving. And it's done in obedience. Again, it, it, is, it is a matter of obedience. Secondly, biblical giving follows the divine example. Verse 9 of chapter 8. It follows the divine example. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It follows the divine example. God the Father, John 3.16, the verse we all probably know. God so loved the world that he... Gave. And so when we give, we're following the divine example. And how does Paul wrap up his whole discussion on the collection? Chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. His indescribable gift of Christ and salvation 
grace, justification, the work he's doing in our lives, and even this work also, this gracious work of giving. Third, what is the result of biblical giving? There is a reward, and we might kind of be hesitant to talk about a reward because we're not giving for the motive of reward, but there is a reward in chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully or generously will also reap bountifully. The concept of sowing and reaping, there is, there is a cause and effect there. You sow corn seed, is that the seed? You get corn. If you sow just a little bit, you'll probably only get a little bit. If you sow acres and acres, you're going to get acres and acres of corn. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good work. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality uh, through which us is producing thanksgiving to God. There is a blessing. There is a reward. It may or may not be physical riches. And we don't, we don't focus on that. We don't teach that you give and so God will multiply that seed and let you then buy your newer house and bigger car and, and a bigger boat. No. But there is reward. Spiritual blessing, joy, but there could also be um, um, material blessings as well. We don't want to discount that. The last result of biblical giving in chapter 9 is thanksgiving and praise to God. Paul says in verse 11 of chapter 9, uh, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service, this service of giving, is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. And so our giving allows others to rejoice for, their, for God's provision in their life, and it brings joy to our life as well. My desire for you and for me, first, is to evaluate, do we have the heart of biblical giving? Is, is my giving optional? When I feel like it, when I have extra money in my account, is it an obligation that I have to do to earn God's favor or to keep in God's favor? Is giving uh, done with a, with a joy and a privilege and motivated by God's grace, what he's given me in Christ and in this life in, respond, in a response to that? Is that what motivates my giving? So I ask you an application to... Would you look in your heart before God? This is between you and God. Lord, do I have a heart of biblical giving? Do I have these 10 characteristics? If not, would you do that work in me and, and change me from the inside out? Perhaps for some of you this is brand new and a, a new concept. Why would I give to God at all? And perhaps for some of you, it's totally foreign because you don't know Christ and he's not your savior. And therefore, there's not the work of grace that brings about a result of giving. And if that's your, if that's your situation, I call you to faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, became poor, he lived on this earth, became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. He was nailed to a cross and our sins were nailed there with him. And our guilt was on him as we, were, we learned a few weeks ago with, in the communion Sunday. Our guilt was laid on him. He drank that cup that we deserved, that wrath of God. And so that his righteousness could be applied, credited to my account. And I, I could be declared by God not guilty. And so if you don't know Christ, I call you to repentance in love and in, in, uh faith in him as, as your savior. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word that's clear, that is convicting, it affirms um, 
right behavior and, and obedience, and it calls for repentance. Thank you for the heart of the Macedonians to give joyfully, sacrificially, as a privilege, motivated by your grace, even despite crushing circumstances and deep poverty, to your glory and as an act of worship to you and to your causes. Would you give Southside such a heart for those who have manifested that? Thank you. For those who uh, need that, would you do your work and act in your spirit of conviction, not coercion, but the conviction of the spirit to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.